and the theme for this year's World Prematurity Day is Together for Babies Born Too Soon, Caring for the Future. And as I would mentioned earlier, the aim of the day is to really raise awareness of the challenges and burden of preterm births in Uganda and globally. And this uh, webinar has been facilitated by the National Safe Motherhood Expert Committee and the Newborn Steering Committee. Just before we start, I'll just like to give some housekeeping rules uh, to ease on communication. Uh, please kindly uh, switch off your video so that we can have a good communication. Uh, secondly, please mute your mic if you're not a presenter and you can raise your hand at the end of the presentation for any questions or comments. And throughout the presentation, you can kindly send in chats for any questions or comments you would like to make. I would like on this, um, I would like to now invite um, Dr. Nachibuka Victoria, who is a pediatrician and subspecialty training with neonatology, who works at Insambia Hospital. Uh, Victoria, you're welcome. Please share your slides and you can begin your presentation. Thank you. Dr. Victoria, do you want me to share your slides from this side? Has Dr. Victoria dropped off? I'm, I'm just checking for her in the link and I'll get back to you. Um, Richard, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I think she has dropped off, but she, we shall just communicate with her quickly. She was online by the time we started. Exactly, yeah. Um, maybe we would uh, move to the next presenter and come back to her when she's back. Um, thank you, Richard. I think on next person that's available is uh, Hilda Namakola, who I can see online. As sister cannot see online. So I, I will kindly request um, Hilda Namakola if she can share her slides and we can begin with her presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Moderator. I request Dr. Kajimu to share the slides from his screen. Good afternoon, all participants. Thank you so much, Mr. Moderator and the organizing committee of this webinar. My name is Anamakula Hilda. I'm from Uganda. I'm a nurse by profession, working with Adara as a clinical educator. Uh, I'm a nurse who has worked with Chuoko Hospital for nine years as a NICU nurse. And after that, I went for my bachelor's 
counselors and joined Adara. And I'm currently working with Adara. Adara briefly works in partnership with Tuoko Hospital to support and promote maternal and newborn health. But also it works with public hospitals like Nakaseke to promote maternal and, and newborn care through knowledge sharing and mentorship. So I'm going to be taking you through supporting families with babies born too soon. Next. Previously, families, particularly mothers, were separated physically from their babies, being substituted by healthcare professionals who took on the parenting care function of these babies. And this has shown negative outcomes. One of them is physical and emotional detachment. Parents lack the knowledge to care for their babies, decreased ability to survive and thrive, and this calls for involvement of families in the care. So family involvement has a great impact on the later outcomes of babies born too soon. And this can be achieved through family-centered care approach to support these families so that they learn and cope up with the care for these babies. Next. What is family-centered care? It is an approach of providing health care which recognizes the importance of family for a hospitalized baby. It can also be defined as the professional support to the baby and its family through participation, engagement and sharing in a context of empowering and negotiation. Next slide, please. So what are the aims of family-centered care? Maintain and strengthen family roles and bonding. Now, we need to involve families in tasks that they are able to do. For example, feeding, kangaroo mother care, ETC, so that we promote the bonding. Create partnership with families. We want to work with these families. We do not want to work on a baby, but we want to work with babies and their families so that we promote their health. Provide continuing care to ease transition to home. We want to improve long-term outcomes for the baby and the family. So we want to reduce morbidity and mortality. Provide positive and respectful interaction with families guide families to identify their own strength in the care of their babies. So we want to identify the tasks that they are able to do, and we want to identify them so that they are able to perform them and they get involved in and as we support these families. We also want to empower families to make informed decisions. Now, we want to encourage them to give them an opportunity to air out their opinions as we listen to them and we give them room to make decisions. Next slide. Concepts of family-centered care. Recognition that family is the centerpiece of the baby's life. Now, because these babies, because these families are the primary and constant caregivers to these babies, they need to be recognized during the care. Failure to do so can result in two issues like abandonment of the baby, difficult transition from hospital to home, and this reduces the chances of survival and thrival. Cooperation between families and healthcare professionals, this one is paramount, very, very important. Clear communication and a bidirectional exchange of information between families and healthcare professionals. Now, the information that we give to these families shouldn't be misleading, but rather empowering them as a family. And room should be created for these families to communicate on any rising issues during the care. Families should always be treated with dignity and respect. Everyone needs respect 
everyone needs to be treated with dignity. So as you're taking care of this baby that belongs to this particular family, please treat them with dignity and respect. Highest grade of flexibility and accessibility when providing healthcare services. Levels of support. Induction at admission and identification of primary caregiver. Now we need to orient the family to relieve anxieties. This should be done on admission, orient them about the place, the task that they are supposed to get involved in, who to communicate with when there is any issue about their babies arising. And you also identify the key family members, for example, the father, the mother, who will take care of this baby during hospitalization and after discharge for empowerment. Daily training schedules. Now we see it in our picture. These are mothers having their daily training schedules. Demonstration and practice. Encourage return demonstration and continuous practice so as to empower them in their care of their baby. Support supervision. This should be done by healthcare professionals as during the stay of this baby in the hospital. Peer-to-peer -peer learning. This can be achieved through their daily schedules. Families can learn from one another. Independent doing, now this comes in when we are preparing baby for discharge. Then discharge counseling, it is also a package that should be given to these families and continuum of care at home. Family is doing most of the things for the baby while at home with minimum supervision. Next. Now we have the hospital to home program. What is it? In Chiwoko Hospital, family-centered care is implemented through a program called Hospital to Home. It was initiated two years ago by Adara Development as a community arm of Chiwoko Hospital NICU. It involves specially trained VHTs supervised by community midwife, and it involves nurses, ward doctors, the discharge coordinators and neonatal therapists and the family as well. So this program is designed to give newborns the best start to life and it ensures vulnerable infants receive follow-up support after discharge from the NICU. Next. One of the roles of the hospital to home program as a community arm of Chuoko Hospital New born care is to promote lactation and breastfeeding, sorry, is to promote lactation and breastfeeding. And this is done through helping mothers and training them to do hand expression of breast milk because these babies are too small, they may not be able to breastfeed initially. So we train mothers to express, hand express breast milk and when time comes for these babies to start breastfeeding, yes, the mothers are supposed are supervised and supported to position and attach their babies on the breast. It also involves you know, developmental supportive care. And this one is done through teaching mothers to do kangaroo mother care. It is continuous, it should be continuous for these small babies. We also have the chew best feeding practices. Now, chew best feeding practice is an individualized self feeding experience based on baby's behavior. So, if baby's brains are still developing because they are still very young and they are immature, and there are many negative stressors in newborn brains which affect their development. So, with chew best feeding, we are driving from being task oriented to infant oriented. Previously, we were driven by giving volumes to the baby, what it could take at a particular time. But this time we are being driven by the behaviors of the baby to start feeding and to continue feeding. 
So, and sometimes this ba these babies while feeding, they show signs. When they are ready to feed, they will show signs. When they are not ready to feed, they will still show signs. And when such signs appear, for example, if they show the stressing signs, showing that I'm not ready to feed, changes have to, have to be made. And maybe even feeding can be stopped. And a method, another method of feeding can be used. Feeding education and support, it is ongoing, right away from admission, during the time of hospitalization, up to the time of discharge. And when they also go to the community, they are continuously educated by the VHTs. Regulation of environment, of environmental stimuli for positive outcome. Now, the sensory organs of these babies are still immature. We need to be very sensitive about the environment, particularly light, it should be limited. Sound, it should also be limited. If it means illuminating light for only that baby, illuminate light for only that baby when you're doing any kind of procedure to this baby. Uh, respond to alarms in the ward. If you're in the ward, respond to alarms. At home, we encourage families to minimize sounds like radio, TV sounds, to allow these babies have enough rest and to also develop well. Next. Next. Discharge planning. Now, in hospital to home program, the discharge preparations begin upon admission, and most of this work is done by the discharge coordinators and the neonatal therapist. It, is it provides individualized care plans for each patient because we know each family is unique in its own way and each baby is unique in its own way. We use a team approach to work towards discharge. So it is a multidisciplinary teamwork, which involves doctors, nurses, neonatal therapists, and the family itself. Educate and empower families. It is ongoing, but even on discharge, it is done, and there is a special discharge package that is given to these babies. So it helps to make these families comfortable and confident to take care of their babies, even when they go back home. Next. Follow up. The hospital to home also plays a role of doing the follow-up in the community. So it, the, the follow-up is for both the community and the hospital. So in the community, we have the VHTs and uh, the community midwife. So the community midwife supervises the VHTs. As we see in our picture, our community midwife is doing supervision of the VHT on visitation of one of the families. So VHTs do assessments for danger signs, monitoring of growth and development when they visit these families. They also do continuing, continuing education for these families. They also do referrals on identification of any complications. When they visit these babies, they refer them to any nearby healthy care facility. If a mother prefers to come back to Chuoko, then the mother can bring the baby back to Chuoko for further management. In the hospital, the review clinic is run by nurses because these nurses know more about these babies. So a nurse will also do assessment for danger signs, monitoring of growth and development, will continue to give health education to this family. And um, in case she identifies any complications, she will send this baby to the ward doctor who will review this baby and further management is done for this baby. Next. Next, please. So ever since the initiation of the hospital to home program in Choco Hospital, NICU, we've had positive feedback from NICU staff. And these are some of the feedback. One, 
from the NICU nurse. Before H2H, I really wasn't sure how these mothers were doing because we did not have education classes. The mothers would have phobia, like no relationship between the nurse and the mother. And you find out that there is a big gap. She wouldn't even want to tell you that her baby is not passing stool, for example, because she fears you. So H2H has bridged that gap. Healthcare workers are now able to coordinate with families and there is good communication between families and healthcare workers. We have seen that when you interact with the mother, they are able to open up. Yes, this is very true. Every time you interact with a mother, you're relieving anxieties and these mothers are able to open up. When they have issues, they open up. I work with the families. Now this is from the NICU clinician. I work with the families. I love the cooperation between the medical team and the families. We no longer work on babies, but we work with babies and their families. This is what we have adapted in our Shiwoko as a newborn care center. We do not work on babies, but we work with babies and their families. Next. Thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you, Hilda, for your presentation. Um, for the next uh, five minutes, we would like to have some questions or comments. So kindly, either write a question in the chat or you could raise your hand and then I would ask you to please ask your question. Thank you. Hilda, if you look in the chat, there are a few questions that have come through. And so as we're waiting for anyone, Um, uh, Dr. Dewe, your network is breaking, but Hilda, just to help you read through the chat, um, one of the questions that is coming through is, could you give more clarity on Q-based feeding? How does it work in relation to the daily feeding volume calculations? Well, with Q-based feeding, we are directed by baby's cues. cues. Cues are signals that the baby will show that I'm ready to feed or I'm tired of feeding or I don't want to feed. Now, this is a very common thing in babies who are born too soon because they are small. Most of the times they're not able to breastfeed initially. They learn, they just learn. So, because they are not able to breastfeed, we are going to just give them expressed breast milk. We can give them expressed breast milk either through NG tube or by cup. When they are able to breastfeed, they, are not, they may not be able to breastfeed enough. So we have to go slow. We do not pack them with volumes of milk. We do not want them to get lots of milk at the same time because this stresses them. So what happens if they are stressed, if they show signs of stress? If that, for example, if a baby has been feeding by cup and it is just spilling out the milk, it is supposed to take, for example, 15 meals, but it has taken like five meals and it is slipping off or it is spilling the milk. What we will do, instead of continuing with cup feeding, we will instead go for nosogastric tube and let this baby rest so that it can develop and grow. This will help its brain to grow and to develop very well. Um, thank you, Hilda, for the question. There's also been a question on how, how does the mother measure the feeds to be given to the baby to prevent overfeeding? Well, it is a collaboration. One, it is prescribed by the doctor, 
first of all, it is prescribed by the doctor. So what the doctor will prescribe, the nurse will go ahead and calculate. So what we do after calculating, we will tell this mother to measure. We have measuring feeding cups that we use for them to feed. Some of them, most of them are able to read because these cups are having, are having measurements, they show measurements. So we use these feeding cups and this is how these mothers measure this milk. Um, thank you, Hilda. I think there's one more question about which signs do you use to determine when the baby wants to feed or does not want to feed? I'll start with the signs that are shown when the baby is ready to feed. One of them is the rooting, rooting sign. Another one is uh, sucking of the thumb. The baby will suck the thumb and this will show you that I am ready to feed, I want to feed. Some of them can even cry, they cry. Some of them like grab clothes that come around their mouth. And these are all signs showing that I want to feed. But when they do not want to feed or when they have fed a little and they, they are showing you that I'm not ready to feed now, they can sleep off, they can split the milk, they can spit the milk, sorry, spit the milk, they can sleep off. So those are some of the signs that are shown by these babies. Some of them become tachycardic, even they can become tachycardic and then you need to stop. Some of them can get increased rate of breathing, tachypnea, they can become tachypnea. Some of them can even be, go into apnea. Those are all signs to stop feeding. Some of them can even show a stop sign by raising their hand. So all these are signs to stop feeding. Um, thank you very much, Hilda. And thank you once again for presenting the talk on supporting families with babies born too soon. I think the H2H program has been a very good experience within Chiwoko. And I think we have learned a lot about it. Thank you very much. I would like to request um, I would like to request Dr. Nachibuka Victoria, I hope now online, to please share your slides and make your presentation on critical challenges in managing premature babies in Uganda. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you very much. Uh, is my presentation on? Okay. Thank yes, you. It is so, just okay. slideshow. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm going to talk about critical challenges for management of preterm baby, uh, preterms in Uganda. Um, I'll look at the mortality due to prematurity, the challenges in our special care units and intensive care units. And then I also just chat our way forward. So globally, we have 2.6 uh, million uh, babies who die and of these, 1.1 million occur in Africa. Prematurity accounts for 35% of all the deaths, and then infection, and then uh, HIE. So about 15 million preterm uh, newborns are born each year globally, and about 2.3 million are babies who are less than 32 weeks. And majority of these babies actually need intensive care and ventricular support to improve. Prematurity is the leading cause of newborn deaths over the whole world. And many of them, when they survive, they have long-term disability, including hearing and visual deficits. When you look at the under five deaths, neonatal deaths account for 47% but prematurity alone actually accounts for 16%, making prematurity one of the leading cause of child deaths and an important cause of disability and loss of human capital. So it's something that we must focus on if we are to reduce neonatal mortality. 
In Uganda, we have about uh, 226,000 babies who are born each year, and about 27% of all the neonatal deaths are secondary to prematurity. When you look at the different hospitals, you still find prematurity as a major cause of deaths in the neonatal period. When you look at Matani Hospital, 60% of all the deaths in the neonatal period are due to prematurity. In Chiliandongo, in Zambia, you see that prematurity contributes a big proportion of mortality in the neonatal period. This slide is just showing us uh, when the, the different uh, babies uh, uh, will die and realize that in the first um, 12 hours, it's usually the immaturity that is going to cause the, the deaths. And then in, the, in 12 to 72 hours, it's the respiratory distress. And in the first one week, basically it's respiratory distress that is going to cause uh, deaths for these babies. But as you go on, you find things like um, and sepsis and, and necrotizing enterocolitis as a major cause uh, of mortality amongst these babies. In Africa, majority of our deaths occur in the first one week. In Gambia, 57% of all the deaths occurred in the first one week. And even in Uganda, a study was done, 52% of all the deaths occurred in the first one week. And majority of these babies actually are preterms. One of uh, the postgraduate students did a study in, in Kawempe and found out that majority of the babies were dying in the first, eight, first 48 hours and all these babies actually were preterms. Meaning that majority of these babies actually die in the first one week and in the first very few hours of life. It's important for us to focus there. Um, having said that 75% of all these deaths actually are really preventable. And when we look at the US and the UK, we realize that the certain interventions they put in place to say that uh, the neonatal mortality uh, can reduce. One of them was the public, uh, the public uh, interventions like immunization was able to only reduce the mortality by 25%. And when they started having um, improved care in pregnancy and essential newborn care, the mortality only reduced by 50%. But when they introduced um, uh, special care units and intensive care units, the mortality reduced by 75%. And that is where we want to go. If you want a mortality to be at least at 12 and not at 27. So special care units and intensive care units can have the mortality for preterm babies and we can be able to, re to reach our, uh, our goal of having 12 deaths per 1,000 uh, live births. And if we able to, in, to invest in our special care units, we should be able to reduce our mortality by almost by 90%. The Ministry of Health and other partners have actually prioritized uh, putting up and the special care units. And um, however, we still have a number of challenges. And some of the challenges include infrastructure, you find that many district hospitals don't have appropriate infrastructure to care for these preterms. The space is very small, like they've been talking about developmental care, you're not able to do it. We don't have space for kangaroo units. Most of our units are crowded. The babies are in two court. You have two babies in one court. And this, the danger of it, it increases uh, sepsis and antimicrobial resistance. So whenever we crowd our babies, we increase the rate of sepsis and antimicrobial resistance. So an ideal ICU should look like this. There should be enough space where a mother can sit and express her breast milk. There should be space between the, 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 the infant warmers where mothers can, can be able to fit and where also health workers can fit. The other challenge is that we really don't have standardized protocols and guidelines. When we did assessments in most of these units, they had a, uh, protocols for social newborn care, but for care of the small baby, KMC, phototherapy, uh, apnea, many other things that disturb preterms, you find that the protocols are not there and they are not standardized. I am going to highlight some of the challenges in management of the common conditions um, uh, for preterms. One of them is respiratory distress syndrome 
we all know it is called also hyaline membrane disease. It occurs among preterms, and 50% of babies born less than 30 weeks are going to have a respiratory distress syndrome. And these babies are going to present uh, with a lot, they are going to present with uh, increased work of breathing because they do not have surfactant. In developed countries, CPAP is the mode of care and it was found to reduce mortality by almost 48% and the need for ventilation by 50%. Other studies that have looked at uh, CPAP in prematurity have reported a reduction of 66% reduction in mortality uh, when we use it appropriately in babies that have respiratory distress. However, many of our units have oxygen but the CPAP is not uniformly used for babies that have a respiratory distress syn syndrome. And many of them actually have improvised CPAPs, which may not actually work very well for babies sometimes with severe respiratory distress syndrome. We don't have blenders uh, for blending our oxygen. When you don't blend our oxygen, much as our babies survive, they're going to be blind. The other problem is also hypothermia. It's one of the major challenges that you can find amongst these babies. You find that babies prepare for their extra life in usually in the last trimester. And environmental temperature is one of the challenges these babies are going to have. Hypothermia is actually an independent risk factor for morbidity and mortality. In a number of studies in Uganda, when they looked at the uh, prevalence of hypothermia among babies that were admitted, actually, in, 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 in Zambia, we found about 83% of the babies admitted in our NICU had hypothermia. And this is similar to other studies, like in Nigeria and even in West Africa. So why do we have to deal with hypothermia? Hypothermia increases the, the mortality by almost 28% whenever there is a degree, whenever there is a fall of a degree of just one, you find your babies are going to die just because of hypothermia. However, attention to thermal regulation is minimal in our units. We, when we are transferring our babies from theater, from the labor ward, we don't pay attention to warm transport. Kangaroo, which reduces mortality, and hypothermia is also not maximized among our babies. The other thing is nutrition. So nutrition is key for survival among a spree terms. When a baby is born at 26 weeks, they require about three grams of protein to grow. And at this age, the placenta can provide it. But when a baby is born, this, this provision of the, of the protein is cut off. And some, it's crucial to start feeding these babies, but sometimes it's challenging. And we want to start feeding these babies as soon as possible. And we start giving them minimal intro feeds. But sometimes many of these babies actually are not able to feed and they're not able to get the, uh, the breast milk uh, in time. When we did a study, uh, an assessment in many of the units, many units lacked protocols for feeding and giving IV fluids. Many babies were starting to get breast milk a bit late. And some people have actually done some studies looking at nutrition among us, these babies. Lucy, one of the postgraduate students in Mulago, reported that 90% of the preterms actually had suboptimal feeding by day seven. Majority of them have not reached full feeds. And this is going to affect how this baby is going to be later on in life. And delay in initiation of feeding has been associated with, uh, with, with poor postnatal growth among us babies. And even Dr. Namirov reported that many babies who delayed to start feeding by 48, 48 hours, they had not yet regained their birth weight by 21 days. Weight gain is, is associated with the neurodevelopmental outcomes. So we find that nutrition is a very big problem among us at these babies. It's important that we adopt lactation and also assist mothers to be able to provide breast milk, uh, enough breast milk at the right time for these babies. The other problem is actually sepsis. You find that most of our babies almost half actually have sepsis, but only one to 2% of these babies actually are investigated. And many organisms like Staphylococcus, Klebsiella are very common. And yet in our units, there is a lot of resistance to the drugs that we commonly use. We did a small study to look at the sensitivity patterns for organisms among preterms. Klebsiella was the commonest and it was sensitive to amikacin and marrow. 
and it is resistant to gentamicin and kepharosporins. And yet these are the common drugs that we use. So you find that many babies die of sepsis, but because we are not able to investigate, we cannot accurately say that these babies really have sepsis. The other common organism is staphylococcal. It's in, from our study, it was sensitive to actually vancomycin and gentamicin, and it was resistant to floxacillin and um, keftraxone. Keftraxone is one of the commonest drugs that we use. So if we do not investigate these babies, we shall never know what organisms are common in our units and what antibiotics we are going to use. And you find sometimes these babies may die even when we are using antibiotics that may not really be working because we have not done the sensitivity and uh, patterns for these uh, for these for these bugs. The other drugs that uh, the other drug which which is really not very common in our units, which I think would help to is a, it, to help to survive these babies to survive is caffeine. We use caffeine to treat apnea, and in several studies they compared caffeine to aminophilin, and it was found to reduce on the need for ventilation, reduce on the duration of apnea, and reduce on the incidence of bronchopneumonia dysplasia, and it improved neurodevelopmental outcomes at 18 months. Uh, caffeine is a preferred drug because you can give it once daily, you can give it orally, and you have episodes of less tachycardia. And however, being a drug that can really help uh, survive of these babies, it's not available in our units. And even the aminophilin that we use sometimes is also not available. Equipment is also another challenge. Many of our equipment, our units lack simple equipment such as CPAPs, incubators, radiant warmers, uh, glucometers, pulse oximeters. Uh, we don't have blenders. Oxygen, oxygen cylinders may not be enough, and sometimes we have oxygen concentrators, which may not be able to provide optimal CPAP. Some equipment is available, but I have you find that it lacks the appropriate oxygen supply. I went to a unit where they bought CPAPs. They bought a CPAP which needed piped oxygen. And that very own hospital did not have piped oxygen. So you find people buy equipment and they do not have the appropriate oxygen supply. And then some equipment is also bought and they don't have and spare parts in Uganda. Some of the equipment, when they, they break down, our technicians are not able to handle. And actually, sometimes they can provide equipment like radiant women, and sometimes our staffs are not skilled to handle or use the equipment. This is one of the radiant women that we, in doing our assessment, we found in one of the units. It was really not working, but this is what people were using. And, the babies were not able to respond very well because of that. Staffing is really a challenge in our units. The staffing levels are, are very low. Many times the newborn units is not cared for. Medical officers usually do rounds in the maternity wards. And many times the newborn unit is left for midwives. Doctors should take charge of the newborn units as well. They should not leave the newborn unit for midwives alone. So. All countries that have reduced their neonatal mortality to less than 15 have actually invested in intensive care units. And just this, this diagram is just showing you the number of babies globally that may need intensive care uh, support. Uh, you find about 20 million of our babies who need uh, special care support, but there is another 10 million that will need intensive care support, if we don't invest in it, then that means it's, we are going to have challenges and we may not be able to reduce our mortality appropriately. So at tertiary care, some of the challenges we have are basically the equipment, sometimes it's very expensive. One ventilator costs about 100 million shillings. One CPAP costs about 20 million shillings, so it's very expensive. And then sometimes these expensive equipment may have technical problems, which may not be adequately uh, addressed by some of our technicians. The other thing we need for tertiary care is surfactant. Surfactant is a drug when we give it, we reduce on the need for mechanical ventilation. Mechanical ventilation needs skill. You need human resource to be available. So surfactant is expensive and also its administration in terms of skill, you have people, uh, it is limited. You have limited people who can be able to confidently give surfactant. 
tertiary care, you need specialists to have very good outcomes. You require a trained neonatologist to manage an ICU. So that's a challenge. Uh, Ministry of Health has started up a program for training neonatologists and neonatal nurses. We hope this problem can be addressed. And then you also need good nursing care. You need a ratio to nurse to the patient ratio of one to one, and you find that we may not be able to afford and we have very few neonatal nurses actually in the country. So that really poses a challenge in the management of these babies. However, the good news is that if we can combine the care, we can combine secondary level interventions and tertiary level interventions, we can be able to reduce our case fatality of preterms from, up, like in our case for Samia, we reduced it from 16.9 to about six. Point eight, and even the survival for our babies improved from like 96 to 100 for the low birth weight, then 80 to 80 percent to like 93 for the very low birth weight, and 28 percent to like 57 percent among our extremely low birth weight babies. So, to reduce uh, preterm deaths, we need to address the quality of care, essential newborn care in our special care units and also in our intensive care units. Thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Victoria, for the presentation. Mm -hmm. There are several questions that are coming through the chat. Okay. So I would just like you to look through them, but one key question that came through was with regards to improving care and one of the participants asked about the pre-referral packages for preterm infants who are born in lower level health facilities. What do we have in that, in, in that support? So there are several questions with regard to improving care, but I would like you to take a few of them over the next five minutes. Okay, I'll start with that. They need to improve the transport of, of this baby, right transport for, from referral from the lower health units to the higher health units. The package would increase, in, include to keep the baby warm, but you find that most of our ambulances actually don't even have, don't even have uh, an incubator. These babies have respiratory problems. So they would need to be provided with some form of or oxygen support or some like a mobile um, a CPAP. And then of course that these babies need, need to feed. So it's, uh, that, that, that is what the, the, the package would include. And of course these babies also have apnea. It would be good before the babies are referred to the higher center. They are given at least a shot of aminophilin. Or if we can get caffeine, that would be uh, uh, something that that would that would be very good. Uh, someone is talking about the Armenian foil. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your innovation. Uh, in, in given the fact that we we don't have actually uh, maybe incubators, one of some studies. These have reported actually transporting a baby using kangaroo. That would also be an alternative as you transfer this, this baby from the lower health unit to the higher health unit because you have to address warmth. Uh, if the baby reaches a unit, the neonatal unit hypothermic, the chances of dying are very high. So we can transfer this baby actually in kangaroo on oxygen and also make sure that we fed the baby before we refer the baby to the next unit. Um, someone has um, quite a number of questions. Yes, we don't, yeah, we don't use keftriaxone because it increases uh, the, the neonatal jaundice. If we don't have uh, keftriaxone, if you could use another drug like kefotaxim, if a baby has jaundice, uh, that could work as um, uh, an, an antibiotic. Uh, someone has asked, what if a mother has no breast milk in the first two days? Uh, I, I liked the presentation for the previous speaker, and I, I'm, a, I'm a strong advocate for breast milk. I have seen breast milk do so many wonders. Uh, one of the things we must advocate for in our units is to ensure that we have lactation to support these mothers to lactate. So once this baby is in our unit, the neonatal nurse should not sit, the doctor should not sit. We need to go to the postnatal wards and assist these mothers 
to get breast milk. If this mother actually is supported to express breast milk, she'll be able to get the breast milk actually in the first, in the first, in the first uh, 48 hours. We must support these mothers to get breast milk. That is, would be, that is my answer. Um, someone has talked about magnesium sulfate. Yes, magnesium sulfate. When we give it uh, prenatal, it has been found to improve uh, the neurodevelopment for, for these babies. There is WHO recommends it. It's something we can think about to adopt actually as a, as a, as a country. Um, okay, somebody has request as, 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 as how long should we keep a baby on IV fluids before we get breast milk? Ideally, most of the preterms, if a baby is less than 1.5 kilos, we would recommend we keep the baby NPO in the first 24 hours. And then we are going to start feeding a baby in the next uh, 48 hours. There is what they call uh, the traffic feeds or the very small feeds, even if it's just two meals or three meals, that is very important. The importance of feeding this baby is that you stimulate the gut. When this baby is still in the mother's womb, they are swallowing amniotic fluid. And when they swallow the amniotic fluid, it helps the gut to grow. If we keep these babies uh, without feet for a long time, they get atrophy of the gut. And when we start feeding these babies day five, day six, the babies are going to start having feed intolerance. And then you find then we end up stopping the feet. So we should feed these babies at least within the first 48 hours, ensure that we support lactation, ensure that we support these mothers to express breast milk so that we can feed these babies as soon as they can. We start with trophic feeds. There are small, small feeds that you're going to start with in babies who are less than 1.5 um, uh, kilos. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, Victoria. I've been able to answer. <laughs> mm, sorry. Um, there's a question about standard protocols for management of preterm care. Do we have? Yeah, we, we, as the Uganda Pediatric Association, we, we drafted a few protocols. We are awaiting for the ministry to adopt them. And those protocols actually highlight, uh, they, they describe um, things like respiratory distress syndrome and how to, to manage it appropriately. So there are some protocols available which were made by the Uganda Pediatric Association. We are waiting for the ministry to adopt them so that we can have standardized care for preterms in all the regions in Uganda. Okay. Um, any more questions? Um, someone is asking the... Um, uh, is the thanks, mother with uh, triplets? Have you seen the question with the mother sorry, with the triplets? I, triplets? Um, maybe I've missed it. Triplets. Um, uh, a mother with triplets who has failed to produce milk despite hydration, what's the way forward? What, what would you recommend? If a mother has triplets and she doesn't have breast milk? Yes. Well, the same thing it would be just support this, uh, the, 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 the mother to say that she she can be able to get adequate uh, breast milk. We can counsel the mom. We can encourage her to take certain foods that may increase uh, the breast milk because you really want these babies to, to, to get uh, breast milk because it's safe for them. When they get breast milk, they have less infection. They grow properly. They, they have uh, the duration of hospital stay actually is reduced because, uh, because of the breast milk. The breast milk encourages the gut actually to grow very well. So. I think the main thing is supporting. We, we doctors, we should work along with the nurse to support these mothers, see that they can have a breast milk. If you really counsel these mothers, well, support them. I'm Victoria. Them. Turn, Many yeah. times, actually, these mothers get breast milk. Sometimes they're very anxious. So the mothers and support them, then the breast milk will come. I always tell mothers, if a goat and a, and a cat can have breast milk, why not a human being? So we just have to counsel these mothers to have enough breast milk, support them with their lactation, and you see that the breast milk is going to improve. 
Okay. Um, thank you very, very much, Victoria. Mm -hmm. This is time well spent. We will need to move on to our third speaker, Sister Agnes. I hope you are on. I would request you to kindly share your slides and make your presentation. Thank you. But please keep the questions going in the chat. Uh, all our speakers will be able to make comments and even members who have joined the meeting have been commenting and answering questions. Thank you very much. Sister Agnes, could you get near to your microphone? We can't hear you clearly. Richard, please, could you put it on slideshow? Yes. Please proceed, Agnes. Sister Agnes, you're muted. Please unmute. Okay, you can proceed. Sister Agnes, we can't hear you, or is it just me? Um, Richard, she is unmuted, but we are not able to hear her, and there is no evidence that um, there is some volume coming through. Our sister Agnes is just well sorting out some issues on the slides. Let me do that very fast and we'll have our one. Um, thank, thank you, Richard. And as we're waiting for her to come on, please, members, you can keep asking questions in the chat and presenters will be able to answer. Okay, we can proceed to sadness.
Hello. 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 Yes, Hello? Victoria. Okay. I'm with Agnes. Can she present from my PC? If you guys, if you people yes. have the her presentation, Agnes, just. Yeah. Uh, yes, 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 yes. She can. And and her slides have been shared. So please go okay. ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'm just talking about supporting healthcare professionals. Yes, Richard. <laughs> Let's proceed. Yeah, so my presentation now outline, there's introduction, what is the situation in Uganda, capacity building initiatives that we've done, then achievements out of that, challenges, recommendations. So sick and small neonates can survive with timely high quality inpatient care, as Vic has just highlighted in the first presentation. And preterm birth is now the leading cause of the under five deaths worldwide, with one million direct deaths and approximately another million where preterm is a risk factor for neonatal death due to other causes. And 75% of the 4 million deaths occur within the first week of life, with the vast majority occurring in the first 48 hours, as Levison et al. 2014. There is a strong evidence that kangaroo mother care reduces mortality among babies with birth weight less than 2,000 grams, mostly preterm, that is Vesso et al. 2015. And the World Health Organization has endorsed KEMC for stabilized newborns in health facilities in both high income and low resource setting. So what is the situation in Uganda? Neonatal mortality is still reportedly at 27 per thousand live births. Those are the reported but I think it's more than that. Then this is due to low knowledge on care of preterm infants among neonatal clinicians, including the nurses, midwives, doctors, and the rest of the support group. We also have poor management of preterm. That is some okay as Vic has just been emphasizing. Respiratory support, we lack the CPAPs. Nutritional support, that's talking about feeding in time, feeding enough and telling the mothers what to do, then timely transfer to high level facilities for advanced care in case we've got this preterm and we can't move on to care. Then capacity building, how have we done it? We've done it through skilled best classroom training, whereby we've done for frontline health workers, those are the nurses, the doctors, teaching them the actual skill, like you see in the pictorial, the midwife is being shown how she can resuscitate a baby as she works. Then there's high impact interventions focused on, like keeping the babies warm, like doing KMC in time, feeding the babies in time, giving the medications, and that helps them to carry on caring for the babies. Then we have also done across the region, West Nile, Obusi, and the rest. Those are some of the districts mentioned where we try to support the 
healthcare workers to care for the babies. And to date, a total of more than 1,000 healthcare workers have been trained, like we've had those hands on trainings to help them get the skills. Then what have we done in mentorship and coaching sessions, like on site, on KMC, we teach them how to position the baby, how to wrap, and you see those midwives watching, and they do it and they are really helping their babies. Then examining the baby, those are all on site. We work with them, show them how to do it, and then they carry it on. Next. Then other innovations in knowledge and skill transfer. We've used social media, like we form WhatsApp groups where the midwives, the doctors, if they get a challenge with the baby, they're able to ask and we respond timely and care for that baby online. Then we've had in call-in sessions. As they receive babies, they can call you up and we're able to manage a baby by just a call and you make that baby survive. Then we've also, as Vic has just said, standardizing some of the practices, like nosogastric tube for some facilities, it was a dream. Yeah, they don't think that they can use that tube to feed. So very small a baby, even less than a kilo, they think the mother can breastfeed, which is not true as Hilda shared, Dr. Victoria has just shared. So those are some of the innovations. Can see some people think the baby should be carried on the back. Then what are some of the achievements as we've done this? We now have newborn champions in supported areas, as mentioned before. They are able to open up neonatal units and they are carrying on the work of caring for the small babies. Then we've created small newborn care corners to stabilize these babies, KMC corners, that can help out to care for these babies because somehow they are forgotten. Then we've also, made it simple. We make this concept simple that they can be able to carry out this. And it has helped them in their own understanding, their own situation, and they are able to care for these small babies. Then we've achieved a lot through 5S approach, sorting and setting. There could have been wasted space with broken chairs, metals, we ensure that we carry them out, clean up the room and create KMC rooms and wards in different areas of the country. Then what are some of the challenges? When there's a created room caring for babies, then there's no border attached, like a midwife. A midwife just peeps, then she, if she finds time, there's no doctor to come and review the baby, making it worse, which is letting us down for those created rooms. Then there is no oxygen available in most facilities. And if there is a cylinder, it is empty. There is no oxygen head. Or if the head is there, there is no key to open up and start the cylinder to run. If they have a concentrator, there is a problem with power connection, making it hard. And it makes work hard. Then changing the mindset to practice change with the available resources is a mere struggle. Most of the healthcare workers think they can't carry it on. Then involving the heads of unit to create the space has also been a bit hard. They think they don't have the space until when you create it with them. Then there's lack of essential supplies like drugs, like antibiotics and the rest, they are not available. Then changeovers, as you teach some of them, they are changed to other units or they are transferred to lower facilities making it hard, or they are transferred to other wards that are not offering newborn care, making it go back to zero. Then community resistance of some life-saving practices, like nosogastric tube. They think it can't work, they can't allow, they think the baby is going to die. So those are some of the challenges. Then what is our way forward? We are recommending that training institutions should include newborn care package in the curriculum so that somebody moves out to go knowing that these babies are part of the care that they are going to carry out so that we can have this straight away from people trained from the schools. Then the health facilities should include these essential drugs on the requisition 
by involving the relevant end users. Like a storekeeper is requesting for drugs, then will not know what is needed in the newborn unit. Then all maternity wards to be constructed with one wing for a neonatal ward, KMC ward, and separate nurses to man the unit. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Agnes, for your presentation. Um, there's a lot of questions that have come up. First and foremost, people would like you to reintroduce yourself. They want to know who you are. So please do that before we go into the questions. Sorry about that. I think about the co connection, but I'm Agnes Chirikumuino, a bachelor midwife, but working as a neonatal nurse at Mlago Specialized Women Neonatal Hospital in the NICU for the last 17 years. And my topic was to share about how we've supported the healthcare professionals in caring for the babies born too soon. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Agnes. If there are any questions or comments, they are welcome for the next five minutes. But one thing I would like to comment about is your recommendation for newborn care package for, for health workers. I can recall in the early 2000s when I went up country, I found myself in an area where taking care of the, the newborn was one of the least things that was of interest within the maternity unit. And I actually had to disturb uh, Dr. Nakaketo to ask her to give us some guidelines then. And I can see that going forward, we are actually moving in the right direction. So Agnes, there's a question. What is your experience in motivating staff while doing mentorship? Thank you so much. So, the way, that, the way you show them that these are small babies that need your care and your blessings from up, there's a way they come and working with them because these are innocents and they're the next, they are the next leaders, they're innocents and the way you work with them, it motivates them to work. And the phone call as you leave them, gives them the motivation that you're with them. So it's not monitor, it is a motivation by hands by skill and the way when they succeed that the babies are surviving they come up to love and work expecting to save these innocents um, thank you agnes there's also a question with regard to upgrading or training of nurses or midwives to become neonatal nurses are there any short courses that are available currently within either the ministry of education or ministry of health Thank you. Vicky can comment on that. Yeah, we, I think Ministry of Health uh, collaborated with Makere University and actually Zambia Hospital. They, we started as uh, a, a short course for neonatal nurses because really there is a big gap. If we want to see these babies uh, survive, I think the first lot is finishing probably in August this year. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Victoria. But the nurse or midwife should have had a bachelor's before she joins to do the fellowship. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Agnes. I think we shall now move on to our last presentation. Um, Dr. <laughs> Margaret Nakaketo. You are welcome to give your presentation on for the world premature. Thank you, Dr. Nakaketo. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Munube. Thank you, Richard, for organizing this webinar. And uh, I think you had all. So we are crowning it with the newborn sharing committee. I'm Dr. Margaret Nakaka.
Kakato, and I chair the Newborn Steering Committee in the Ministry of Health. And currently, to establish this newborn, as you have heard, everybody is lamenting uh, from that book of lamentation. Dr. Richard, can you share my slide? Because uh, I'm on the phone, and uh, Dr. Richard Kajim, hello. Hello? He has shared the slide. Hello? He it has is shared there, the slide. It is up. I don't see it. I don't see the slice <laughs> on my, okay, now I can see. Thank you very much. Okay, now our theme for this year is uh, together uh, with the Bontu sharing for the future. So I'm handling the last part. I think most of the presenters have been telling us what is on the ground and what is happening and uh, they are lamenting about to, uh, so many things. And we are here as the newborn steering committee to make sure we think about that. Uh, next slide. The present. I'm really not going to talk so much about uh, the numbers of. Uh, but we want to see what can we do now, action. We want to go in the book of Acts now, in the Bible. So we have some milestones at the Newborn Steering Committee. And before I proceed, I want to tell you that uh, the Newborn Steering Committee, the first year uh, when we, we started working in 2019, we said, let us come up with a, a new Reborn Uganda chapter 2019 in that we we forget about what has not been done, uh, who hasn't done what, who has, which baby has died, and we focus ourselves to train, as, the, as the Agnes has said, to come up with the structures, to come up with systems which are going to help us to improve the infrastructure, as you have heard everybody lamenting about it. So we came up with what we could say a process improvement plan. And uh, I'm going to give you an example of such. So by background, the infrastructure for providing everybody has been talking about that. It was really basic even at national level. You can, uh, but there was hardly anything to say that this was a NICU in neonatal intensive care. And specialized and critical neonatal Tokyo was really below the standard. Is are there? That is the good thing, so that we can we can really move to the next level. And uh, what we realize that the resources, unfortunately. Everybody thinks that the neonatal care units should be the same at all levels. Therefore, we have structured the level so that each level is providing what they can provide. So our goal is for care and manage system, and we have to have the right structure. If I had it, Victoria, I say you have to have these incubators. And the aim was to contribute to achieving that 30% reduction to get to the 12 per 100,000 in three years. We hope, and uh, we establishing skills training packages, which uh, Agnes has been talking. Regionally and the, and the regional referral hospitals district. What mean by this? That newborn care has been. Midwives, they care for mothers, they know how to deliver. Believe the midwives do what they have to do, and we do nurses and doctors. Nurses are the ones supposed to do neonatal care. You see, when Agnes said she's a trained midwife, but when she decided to come to neonatal, she had to abandon midwifery and just do neonatal care. So we want to, to, to stick to that. 
So I know this slide is crowded, but uh, we had objectives as the newborn sharing committee. The evidence they have told us that high impact, you have to have guidelines, you have to have uh, uh, incubators, whatever Victoria told you all that. Then we have to strengthen the linkages and the referral capacity of facilities. The facilities at the lower level do not have the capacity even to refer because they don't have even the transportation. But still going around the country, we realize that even if we so what did we come up with levels and making sure that the caregiver most of the things which which these babies are born with they can be managed at least if in a health center so we can stabilize a baby and then when we can stabilize a baby at health center three that baby can be transported safely but this business of saying oh go 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 we can we don't have anything to do and the baby dies on the way i think that is what has been our problem and then in partnership with these key stakeholders. So the Newborn Sharing Committee is bringing together all these stakeholders. We identified to what you have heard, they have all these programs. They have been working in isolation there, but the Newborn Sharing Committee fished out all those people who are doing something. And then we are capitalizing on that. That's why I said the opportunities are there. These people have been in the game for so long. If you visit Chuoko Hospital, you will find that they are NICU is almost as if it is a United States nature. And uh, so we are provide, we are trying to train as the Agnes is saying. So we are creating uh, maternal and newborn health networks in the country. I realized that unless as a country or as the Minister of Health, we cluster the facilities within regions we started off in 2019 with the handling Acholi region. And I think we have reached somewhere. And as I speak now, uh, we hardly go there like whatever, but we have created the system, the ADHOs are working. We are making improvement in collaboration. We have in the past realized that, you know, world vision, they are all working in isolation. While the, the WHO gives us so these, uh, I don't know, protocols or whatever, so jumbled up and you cannot really understand the most notable all these under one umbrella, the newborn steering committee, and everybody, before they implement anything, they have to come and present to the newborn steering committee so that we can guide them and we all do the same thing. And now we have developed this uh, uh, sort of uh, systematic way of approaching uh, 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 newborn care and everybody is taking it. What do I mean by referral top-down support? You know, we always think of referral facility upwards, but top-down, we realize that with let me give an example. If uh, Kawempe Hospital has done away with the small baby and the baby has gained maybe 2.5, but this baby still needs care. This baby can be sent to the health center three near the uh, home and the community. And then Kawempe Hospital is left only with, the, that is what all the doctors, they are really specialized care. And you will find that, uh, uh, the best care should be at the level three. KMC, if the mother can be taught KB, can be taught how to follow up babies with KMC. And only these small babies who are born less than 1.25, 1.1, then the, those ones can be followed up at the national level. Uh, current progress established a sustainable system which is responding to all those uh, things which uh, Dr. Vicky, Sister Agnes, Sister Water is talking about. We are trying to, we have established it and we have stratified the levels of care instituted so that we have at the national level, we have 
specialized care. At the regional level, we have critical care. At the district level, we have advanced care. And at the uh, health center four, we have standard care. And at health center three, we have basic care. And we already have uh, the guideline, what is at each level. We cannot go through all of them. But you can see that the equipment at the national level, I will show you Kawem, which we have already done, is not the same as the equipment at Health Center 4. There's no a pediatrician to that. We even found that some of these hospitals... Then we have also developed a quality improvement strategies to eliminate the cause of death was infection. And it is surprising that nobody even saw that all the first extremely dirty. People were not washing hands. There were no hand washing facilities at the units. So how will you prevent infection when this is just an act of washing hands? And I remember we in New Mulago, uh, they collected and then we realized that we washing hands and what reduced by 70% the deaths due to infection. And the, now we, we realize that just washing hands and, uh, and, uh, and scrubbing and teaching these cleaners how to scrub the infection rates. And then we have of uh, course, and also and tested a mental system or program which is uh, uh, working well. We have uh, um, got newborn uh, champions teams in the in the regions at the district level whenever we go to train we leave their team of those we think they are compassionate they really want to do it without being paid they are they, they want to save the next one so those are the type of people we have created in the regions of Acholi and the region of West Nile, because that is where, that's why I said we are going to take this as a region. Because when you take one district or one sub county or one hospital, you cannot see the impact. So we have strengthened the new follow up systems in West Nile and Nacholi region. And we have built capacities of teams to respond to newborn activism. So those are the teams. And, we have uh, involved the management to maintain it to NICU, and they're all now involved in the management of the newborn because we were blaming people for nothing. They just didn't do. I always give an example. I, whenever I enter the um, MSC's office, I always ask them, if your nurse came here and told you, I need 20 sockets, outlets in my unit, and they, and they will say, I will say, are you mad? Where do you, what are you going to do with all those sockets? You find the, you, the small room, whatever small room, but it has two sockets, and yet you, you are asking for an incubator, you are an infusion pump, and, and all those really need sockets. And uh, next slide. So we developed this improvement plan. This is meant to internality of a neonatal care at facility level with the aim of providing quality newborn care services that will lead to patient safety and their satisfaction. Because, so this diagram may be a little bit crowded. Next slide. We first have a set of experts. Those are the types of agonists and they are others. We, we are aiming at 30. So far, I have 22. Uh, to, this one's to implement. And then we started, the, we had the meeting, we collected them together, we shared, we streamlined, we came up with how we are going to run the program, brainstormed around. 
And then we developed the process improvement plan together with that team. And uh, this plan now was to functionalize the new neto care units. We made previsits after that to meet the district stakeholders without meeting those people, without changing their mindset, without them realizing what are their responsibilities. Even if you trained all the midwives you had in Uganda, it has to give money. And the, the DHO know their role, that I have to go, I have to also to train and know what I'm supervising we shall not achieve anything. The MS, the MS says when they come on board, the administrators, when they come on board, when the, the NICU nurse, head nurse goes there and says, I need this, the MS is aware and they can even run now and say, oh God, God let us get some money. Uh, and, uh, uh, we go there and we do an assessment. After doing the assessment, we realize one of the motivating things is the five S. When what everything looks like new, then that I have found that is one of the things which minds is changes the midwives and the nurses, and then they start working out uh, their own way of sustaining that. Um, so after an assessment, one thing when I went to, I remember Moyo was chasing me away. I'm tired of the Ministry of Health. We are tired of these IP. They just come here, they do assessment. So people on our, uh, to the national level, ministry level, we go there, we do not go back. And they said they, they have had assessments and nobody goes. So. The newborn sharing committee committed itself. When we say we are coming in two weeks, we go back. And I really thank you. And I ask them to give me facilitation to go back. And this one now, all the MS, all the DHOs, now even they see me from there, oh, you have come back, newborn, newborn. So they are now taking on the activity as very special and very important. Uh, so we, after doing the assessment, we went back, we disseminated, and during the dissemination, we came up with the plans from the DHO's office, the MSC's office, with the administration, we would have a meeting, we disseminate, and then we, just, we start working out plans. They come up with some solution and you assist them to help them to come up. And the, I can give an example, Arua Regional Hospital. They sat down, they said every first day of the month, first of the month, they scrub, they do big cleaning, they, everybody. And uh, we have lamented a lot about no staffing and why. We have realized that there's a lot of resources which we are not using. For example, the cleaner, we have so, you know, we have these, uh, there are so many systems, but the cleaner in the hospital is, is cleans in the morning and then if the cleaner is given some roles uh, and you say you are the one to talk about hygiene to the mothers and so you teach the cleaner. There's a very proud cleaner in Arua region now. He's very happy with what is happening. And he's the one teaching the mothers and the mothers come in also. The mother is a another resource. We are saying, why does the mother come and you are teaching her how to clean? So that when she goes home, she cleans only the bed of the court, the baby's court. She changes the diaper and all that is like training the mother. But on the other hand, she's giving some hand in the management. Only way you can involve them. So this is like, a, the, we do the slide, the dissemination, right? This is like a flow chart of what is happening. So there's uh, about infrastructure and equipment. We make sure we remodel the structure. We identify the structure. It is surprising that those small spaces which uh, people did the assessment, when you go back and, and we scrub them and what, and we said, I always say, start with what you have. So we get whatever is in the, in the hospital. There are so many things in the stores in what, we pick them, we scrub them, we set them up. And then we we'll go back and the MS I said, Dr. Nagaketo, I have got a big 
tiga room. Dr. Nakaketa is still there. We can't hear you. It will lose Dr. Nakaketa. Um, Richard, I'm just checking for her online. Um, Richard, she's currently offline, but I'm sure she's connecting back. And you remember she said she was using her phone, so which means she's somewhere moving within the country, definitely not in Kampala. I'm trying to reach her. She has an uh, internet connection problem. I'm trying to see what to do in the meantime. Richard Businje, are you online? Yes, I am. Please, Dr. Margaret, suggest that you continue with as she tries to log it back in. Hey, thank you. Uh, picking from where she has just stopped, uh, the, uh, the bit of dissemination. Um, well, the flowchart is just clear on what has to be done at which level, ranging from the infrastructure through health information management system supplies, putting in place protocols or policies to guide teams in. Uh, management of the small newborns. Uh, infection prevention, she has stressed that component uh, loud enough. Then of course, the components of information, education and communication that need to be strengthened across all levels, majorly at community level. The fact that the baby ends up in the community and will take more time in the community as opposed to the facility. Now aspects of clinical service, the other presenters hinted on this, majorly on aspects of mentorship and coaching. And then of course, um, <clears throat> the bit of uh, continuous quality improvement, which comes out clearly when it comes to client services, and then human resource. I can't mention this enough because everybody has stressed it. But of course, the, the unique piece here is trying to isolate the midwives from the newborn unit, because every time if there is a newborn who requires attention and a mother in labor, a midwife will always prioritize the mother. So looking at the nurses and other cadres focusing on the babies has, has been one thing that has been tried out. Next slide. Uh, some of the examples of uh, the plan. Okay. Is Margaret back? Okay, Richard, um, the, the first example that was really perfectly being shared is the, the recent uh, mentorship session that was done region-wide across the West Nile region, whereby there was a clear flow ranging from putting together a team at national level and then uh, selecting sites to be mentored. Of course, this was done with uh, respective district heads and then having a mentee selected, teasing out from the, um, the various uh, high level facilities across the country, but also identifying experts who were put together, taken through um, a session at Kawempe National Referral Hospital, majorly to allow for uniform and uniform package that is going to be cascaded across the, the region. And then the teams were then taken out to the region where the respective district heads had identified the health workers who would hope in the management of the newborns. Particularly focus was put on the nurses and a few midwives. 
So eight uh, mentorship sites were identified and then the mentors who had come from the central region had to sit in and work with these teams for a period of 12 days, having hands-on clinical uh, mentorship, but also working with them in their respective newborn units. This was eventually followed by uh, a follow-up visit to the respective teams that have been mentored when they had moved back to their respective points of operation, which gave room for teams to further um, functionalize or put in practice the skills that have been able to gain from the on-site sessions, but also trying to help them adapt and employ these in their local setting. I've lost the slide, Richard. I can't see my screen. Sorry, my computer lost connection. Just trying to get back on. So um, overall, uh, when we're having this uh, mentorship go on, it happened across the entire region, but um, the states or the points where the mentorship was held were eight. So we had uh, Moyo, Nebi, Arua, Koboko, Ajumani, uh, Nyapea, then Maracha, and then St. Luke, Angal. Now this mentorship allowed for a blend of health workers from lower levels, right from health center three up to hospital level including the regional referral. So these are the numbers that came to different points. The reason being when you leave them at health center four or three, they wouldn't have quality numbers of clients to interact with for them to be able to learn. So they were brought to high volume sites. Next slide. So after the mentorship session, these are some of the things that came through. You note uh, out of the teams that were mentored, only 23% had ever been exposed to newborn mentorship. So the wider majority had never heard about this, but they were continuously trying to save the lives of the babies across their different sites. So it showed much as they were trying to do this, like it was previously indicated in the previous uh, presentations, they will try to do what they can, but not sure of what they're supposed to be doing. So it gave, of course, uh, different and uh, mixed feelings across the teams, as you may not. Some people, whenever mentorships would happen, they would think it's not important to them. Some thought they lacked the support to offer these services. Some thought they lacked the awareness. So along the way, it gave uh, a bigger picture that much as we have the units across the country or across unit facilities, most of the teams working in these units may be learning on job, but they exactly don't know what they need. And this spoke to aspects of need of protocols to be standardized across all points of care, but also to passively build the capacity of these teams. Next slide. Now, when the teams were outrightly mentored, they, they had to, you know, there the were a number of testimonies coming through. You would note teams saying, this is the best skills transfer approach I've had in my career. There was a midwife who had been in service for the last 17 years, but she confessed having been doing wrong, wrong, wrong things. Like you cannot have been in service for the last 17 years Literally, they know I was contributing to the death of babies as opposed to saving them. This training has opened my eyes. So they're, they're quite, of course, you'd feel people feeling convicted, but also motivated to go and create the change they want to see in their respective districts. Like you can check uh, in Omugo, I will never refer such babies from my facility to Arua. So the doctor there would always refer babies to Arua Regional Referral Hospital. Literally, did he know that he was referring to the nurses and midwives to manage these babies. So during the 12 days engagement, he learned a lot and appreciated the fact that he can actually start off by stabilizing and managing this baby at their level, as opposed to referring every baby that shows up and requires care. Next slide, Richard. Now, this, uh, this is a pictorial of the recent, uh, recently commissioned NICU at Kawempe National Referral Hospital. I know most of us um, saw this on media, but like uh, Dr. Naket had indicated, here are some of the processes. When you look at infrastructure improvement, these are some of the things we saw. And now I know all of us can attest to this. We have uh, a very, very good and functional, I, I don't, I say functional for now, that is, meeting the national level 
you know, requirement to be able to handle our newborns. So these are just pictorials. It was in the papers, and most of us in Kampala should have seen this. The other pictorial. Next slide, Richard. So this is still this still is showing us what is in Kawempe. For those of us up country, this is what our national referral Nikki looks like. Of course, teams we are taken through equipment use, mentorship. So this is still Kawempe. We are seeing some of the things that are now happening. We no longer have babies on chairs, but rather we look at this as a, an advanced care point, just like she was highlighting. Now this. Moving beyond Kampala, we see this happening in other districts or the outskirts of the city. So this is in Kamuli, where we are seeing, um, of course, with support from plan, trying to see how they put up a, a neonatal unit. I know for the teams that will be moving to Kamuli, we'll be able to see yet another big newborn unit being set up in the outskirts of Kampala, which will which further promises the survival of the babies across across the country. Let's continue to the next slide. This is still I'm what back, is happening. Yes, over to you, Dr. Nakaketo. Maybe you continue and then I will do the, the answers. Continue I'm with the presentation. The next, slide. next slide. So over to you, conclusion. Uh, here we're saying the 12 days on men mentorship was well received by all the 152 mentees achieving all her intended goals, like we highlighted. Um, all the teams that participated went back and actually started newborn care points, either KMC rooms or newborn care units within their facilities. And of course, the intended content was delivered to the respective teams and triggered the establishment of sustainable systems for newborn care in West Nile region. Uh, this program, of course, Currently, it's undergoing a close monitoring, which we hope to generate uh, the first piece of scientific evidence on the effectiveness of on-site clinical mentorship to improve neonatal health care outcomes on a large scale. Most times, we have had this tried in one district, two districts, but here we are looking at the entire region, having 11 districts, and this is being taken together as one cohort. Challenges are no different from what the other colleagues have highlighted. The bit of human resource remains um, standing out. Funding, of course, funding looks at various spectrums, ranging from equipping uh, infrastructure, but also looking at the, the logistics needed to be able to save the newborns. And of course, uh, complicated procurement procedures. You, you note that this has been a, a bottleneck across most sectors. So you'll not, if, if, if something has to be done, it will go through the long bureaucratic processes to have it delivered, which makes uh, saving lives of the babies now a little bit tricky. Next slide. Uh, acknowledgement goes to UNICEF. So the West Nile program is uh, being funded by UNICEF and implemented by Japaigo and Avis. So the partners have really played a huge role to change the face of West Nile as far as uh, newborn care is concerned. Minister of Health, that has been uh, the, on top of the game, but also the district law governments of West Nile because they've really been at the forefront to create a difference. Plan International taking the lead in Kamuli and then Kamuli district local government and then the Kawempe National, Region, National Referral Hospital Administration, but also the mentors who took on the mantle to create the difference. Thank you, Richard, last slide. Okay, over to you, Dr. Nakaketo. I was trying to fit in the big shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Uh, when I talked about government funding, is that most of these things are funded by, by the partners. And so I, am, I get a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, I want to see that government also comes in and, uh, and uh, supports funding. And when I talk of procurement, uh, there's one uh, METI, I think it's called the Health Center 3. The midwife was sent on the WhatsApp group and said, we don't have a small mattress for resuscitating the babies. And then uh, I, when I said, now if we tell Avis, if we tell UNICEF, they will take six months to bring just a mattress. I had to get 50,000, send it to Waswa, and then Waswa bought and then took it there. They have been immediate. So the procurement processes, are too long, six months, UNICEF takes six months to deliver whatever they are delivering because it has to come from Copenhagen and what. 
So I don't know what uh, system we can put in place, even if it is by the districts themselves. They would tell you now we have to raise with the, the, the vendors, the vendors, what? So I don't know. We have to work on that as we are building the structures. And uh, also the, the other thing, the ordering of medicines. We realize that at Health Center 3, most of the, the medicines like phenobarbitone, because we would like if a baby is born at Health Center 3 and is conversing, should have phenobarbitone, but they don't have such drugs. They don't have uh, uh, these, but we recommend that they stabilize the baby before referral. And we are trying to say, don't refer the baby at night. So stabilize the baby, give all the initial doses, because if you have given them, even the next level has its own problem. So if you are going to start sending babies at night, you are going to have issues. But now I was discussing with the PS and I think we are coming up with a solution that health center threes are going to start ordering their, their requirements through health center four, because health center four, has all these things on their list for ordering. And then Health Center 4 monitors, uh, distributes them to the Health Center 3 as their orders. And then Health Center 4, we, the Health Center 3s will account to Health Center 4 and Health Center 4 accounts. To the so, so, it is a it is very important that we do what we, we create. We, we are looking at all these loopholes and say, how can we do this best? And then we discuss it with the district. Now, uh, we were supposed to have a, a management level district uh, a meeting so that we all come up as Westernite. We come up with one language. We come up with this, almost somehow the same systems but adopted to the different uh, areas. So as I said, we are trying to minimize referrals. I think uh, what, there's a slide where somebody said, oh, I will never refer again. Because they, we got all these people and brought them to the, to the district hospitals for mentorship. And they, even some of them found the babies they had referred. And some of the doctors at health center for referring to the midwife at, the, at, a, 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 at the, another hospital at the, the district hospital. So we are saying, you see, so this bringing them together and now they even have, uh, they have created their own network, uh, health center four, health center three, they are networking and networking with us at the national level at the same time. So these communication structures are very, very important. They, we can save babies by just a call, by just a WhatsApp and they take the photo and say, do this. And we have realized now they are referring only congenital anomalies but the others, they can manage them down there. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Nakaketo, and thank you, Dr. Rich, for standing in the shoes. I think the shoes fitted very well. We have uh, a few minutes to ask any major questions as we wrap up. I think we have spent the last two hours learning a lot about um, how to improve the management of preterms, but I would not like to to end this session without at least thanking a good number of uh, people or partners who helped in making this happen. Ministry of Health, Newborn Steering Committee, National Safe Motherhood Expert Committee, uh, AUGO, that is the Association of Obstetrics and Gynecologists of Uganda, Uganda Pediatric Association, St. Francis Hospital in Zambia, USAID, UNICEF, uh, Macquarie University and very many other partners who maybe I may not have mentioned. So we just have a few to ask any burning questions. And then uh, Dr. Nakaketo, there's a question to you about the standardized protocols for Health Center for how can people access them? Okay, we are, I think we are working with the uh... Richard, you said you uh, you said with that FMI. You call it FMI. I I don't know. And we already have because it's in West Nile we have, uh -huh, whatever it is, and uh, we we have already distributed them in in West Nile. We uh, Katasi Adara did a lot to come up with the standardized protocols, and we have all of them, Victoria, the the, the real ones, the the big ones, because the other one is a pocket book, the one with UPMA, and. Uh, I think we are supposed to uh, replicate it so that that is a pocketbook for the doctor on duty, but we have big laminated, well-received uh, uh, protocols at, at from Health Center 4 
the hospitals, the regional hospitals and the like. We are, we are distributing them, but we have to train you first. We cannot just bring the protocols there and you don't know even how to use them. So after that training, so the whole of West Nile, all health center for Avis, I think, is the one which printed them and we have put them in place. These are national protocols, international protocols. So, but, so we are going to have them, but what we are trying to do now is to engage more. Now we are, we, I think we are going to take the Western region. I've started working with Baylor. So we are going piecemeal, piecemeal. The others will, we may keep dying a little bit, but we, as others are coming up and they are doing small, small things, but we have to take blocks, blocks. I, I think this is the right way to go. Others can advise me whether it is a better way because I tried two districts, Buyenda and Kamuli. I tried one district, Busia, but then you find that the, the others, the, the outskirts, the, it's a problem. As we're doing Kawempe, without doing those peripheral ones, we are just uh, somehow, we may not do, get it right. So we are also working with the, the FSHI, whatever it is, to, to see that those peripherals of Kawempe, which feed into the national, that they, they even when they close the unit and then they say, all of you, I was in the meeting this morning and the, the, all of them weekend, the doctors down at the health center force don't work. So everybody comes to Kawempe. No, we have to find a way. We have to find a system which operates so that we work. Thank you, unless there's another question, but we are all, I mean, we are all in need, everybody, I want everybody to join us, report whatever, if you have, you need help, Dr. we Naka. can come there. Hmm. Dr. Nakaget, I was also going um, to ask that you inform our colleagues online about the World Prematurity Day commemorations. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. The World Prematurity Day commemoration is going to be held in uh, Jinja, but, sorry, Kamuli district. And we are going also to commission uh, guest of honor, likely to be Minister, of Health, Minister for Health, General Sa Cheng, Honorable General Sa Cheng. And uh, unfortunately, we are going to have only 250 guests advice from RDC because of the COVID. But we are going to have also a sci the scientific one. We are going to, actually all these niches we are talking about, we have made videos and they will be running on the Ministry of Health uh, uh, website. They will be running on some of the television, I think in TV, we are, we are organizing all that. And uh, there is also the newborn magazine and we shall also recognize some of the champions who have uh, what, but, uh, Please tune in. We are. We shall send you uh, where you can tune in, and uh, uh, the presentations. We cut them out, and we did this one. We did the webinar. Thanks to Richard and Team Safe Motherhood. We are glad that you hosted us. So, Kamuli, 17th November. Uh, we shall be there. Is that all, Richard? Thank, thank Is you, Doctor Makaketo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that was the big highlight. I will just like to thank everyone and hand over the, the mic to, to Richard to close. Thank you very, very much, Richard. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Deo Gracias Monove. Uh, Dr. Deo Gracias is the president of the Uganda Pediatric Association and we're very Happy to have you host uh, moderate this webinar. Thank you, our speakers, Dr. Victoria Nachiboka, uh, Sister Hilda Namakula, Sister Agnes uh, Chirikumuino, and Dr. Margaret Nakaketo. Thank you for sparing time to share with us. I think a lot of questions came in through the email while people are registering for this webinar. And you can see a lot of desire and need to people to receive information how to better manage uh, sick and small babies. I would, uh, I, I would challenge the Uganda Pediatric Association and the newborn sharing committee to see how we can organize these learning events online where many other people are able to join even across the country. We have people are joining in from Ethiopia, from Somalia, quite a number of them as well learning from Uganda. 
So we need to see how to drive this one. I want to thank the National Safe Motherhood Expert Committee for allowing to host this webinar. Uh, Dr. Biangisha, do you have uh, any remarks as we finish? JP. Yes, actually, I have managed to get on. Hello? Yes, Dr. Biamgisha. Oh, yeah, this is very good. Thank you very much, the presenters and the members who have actively participated in the discussions. Uh, what is evident is that, one, there is a lot of, of knowledge and information that is not shared, uh, even universal or national. We need to really see how this can continue. And the, but also significantly what I see and you heard from the presentation is that there is a lot of progress in terms of handling the smaller babies, uh, in terms of special care units, NICUs. Uh, so it looks like we are really moving in the right direction. So Dr. Naka Keto and the teams and the other members who are presented, thank you so much. Let's continue the efforts uh, to save not only the mothers, to save these babies. I think it is critical. We, we have been saying that we need to see how we can move the age from the 28 weeks to the maybe 22 or 24, so that we are able to, to talk and uh, compare our, our records with the international groups. And it looks like we are moving in that direction. So thank you all, thank you members. Let's continue with the, the efforts. Thank you the pediatricians and, and neonatologists who are continuing to save the smaller babies. But as you can see, it is a combined effort. And as you say, thank you to the National Expert Group on Safe Motherhood. Thank you, everyone, and bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Biam uh, who is the co-chair of the NASMEC uh, team. Uh, the members would call it a day for will say share the slides and the recording on your emails that you used to register. So look out for that email in the next few days and it will be with you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, evening, sorry. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the moderation, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you.